That's the biggest bell I have, so if that doesn't do it, I have to yell. All right. We begin. Chapter 3, A Rule for Living, in the Benedict Option by Rod Dreher. Um, as we begin today, you'll recognize, if you've read the chapter, that I, I would say the, the dower dial has been turned back a little bit in this chapter as he tries to, to form for us something of the structure of a, of a vision for the future and really sort of the, the skeleton of the Benedict Option. The, the first chapter is an introduction. The, really, the second chapter is about how in the world did we get to where we're at today. Um, this chapter is about are we going to try to reverse 700 years of human history? And the answer is no. Well, then what are we going to do? And his, his, his notion is to basically follow the Benedict rule, not all become Benedictine monks. But notice what St. Benedict put in place in the midst of the fall of Rome, or uh, the aftermath of the fall of Rome, and see what he did to build a structure for a, a Christian society, and see if we can't match that somehow in our own context. That's what a rule for a living, chapter 3, is all about. And we shall begin in a moment after we pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has committed to Thy Holy Church the care and nurture of Thy people, enlighten with Thy wisdom those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of Thy truth, they may worship Thee and serve Thee from generation to generation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, a rule for a living. This photo, by the way, is... Nursia, or Nursia, I think he says, uh, he pronounces it, the hometown of St. Benedict, which actually didn't have a Benedictine monastery, he says, until the 10th century or something to that effect. But nevertheless, I will say I resist slightly the uh, romantic ideas he has about the actual town of Nursia and the, and the uh, 30-something, 20-something uh, people that are putting together uh, a Benedictine order there now. There seems to be a little bit of a glow about the town and those individuals, and I resist the glow, okay? <laughs> Sorry. So if, uh, if Father Cassian has a, has a strong woolly beard and seems to speak to you as your own father would speak to you, I go, Bleh. <laughs> I don't want to hear about that. <laughs> Just give me the facts, please. So I resist sort of the, the dreaminess of this chapter. Honestly, I think for good reason, because if we get dreamy and romantic about this, it'll fail in no time, no time flat, because, uh, um, you know, if you're infatuated with something, the infatuation lasts for a time until you're bored, and if we're going to build a, a something like a structure upon which we can move forward into the future, it cannot be based on romanticism about uh, Father So-and-so or... or uh, brother so-and-so who floats about in his robes in Nursia somewhere. When you go to Nursia, you'll find out it's just people. <laughs> and the guy in the vestments is just some guy. That's it. That's the shocking thing about reality in the church, is the guy with the hat on and everything is just some guy. It's Christ who's, who's at the center. So uh, first of all, he, he, he says, if we're going to have order, we should probably know why we, have, we need to have order. And some comments about liquid modernity, a, a term he uses throughout the book, which I think is a very helpful term. Uh, he begins with some thoughts here. He says, when we lost our Christian religion in modernity, and I think what he means is basically the, the overarching sort of dominant nature of, of the Christian faith in the Western world, when we lost that in modernity, we lost the thing that bound ourselves together and to our neighbor, and anchored us both in the eternal and the temporal orders. Remember the word religion, as he describes it, comes from a root word which simply means to bind. And of course you're thinking, oh, that binding is bad. Part of the reason you think binding is bad is because we live in modernity, and they say, you've got to be free of all the, of all the, the shackles of anything that tells you you can't do something. I don't know. Um, Religion binds us together, binds us to Christ, and binds us to an order. 
I'm not fond of the of this the phrase that says it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Eh, I you know okay, there's a relationship, yes, but there's a religion as well, and the word religion is not the end of the world. It's uh, it has something to do with order, and actually, I would say the fact that the church resists order is a bit of a sign of the times, a bit of a problem, actually. So. We don't resist order here. <laughs> uh, he says, we are adrift in not modernity anymore, liquid modernity. In other words, you've noticed that things are changing faster now. And in fact, seeing things seem to, to slide off to the right and then slide off to the left. And the things that were wrong 10 years ago are right now. And the things that are right now were wrong five years ago. And you don't know what to do. That's liquid modernity. Um, an anti-culture. He says, the forces of dissolution from popular culture are too great for individuals or families to resist on their own. We need to embed ourselves in stable communities of faith, which I'd rather say the church than stable communities of faith. But uh, uh, nevertheless, you see a church here that seems very well rooted, grounded, established, foundations, pillars, structure, order, religion. Sorry. <laughs> uh, in the midst of liquid modernity, uh, in the midst of a rising tide, you may look for the ship. Where's the ship that's going to stay afloat in the midst of this? Or where's the island, he says. Some resist this idea of the island, so feel free to resist if you like. He says, in the Benedict Option, we're not trying to repeal 700 years of history, nor are we trying to save the West. We're only trying to build a Christian way of life that stands as an island of sanctity and stability amid the high tide of liquid modernity. That's a good uh, thumbnail sketch of what the whole point of this book is all about. You can resist it or discuss it or, or take bits and pieces that work and leave others behind if you like, but that's the basic gist of, of the Benedict option right there. And what does he do to find that structure? He looks to the, the strategy, the schema of St. Benedict and his rule, which is actually quite short. If you wanted to read through it, you easily could. Of course, he's building a monastery for monks, and we're not monks in a monastery. Nevertheless, the structure and the rule is intended uh, to apply to most in the Christian life. And so he's got eight points here that we're going to go through. And I used to have, when I first did this, was the point and then some questions, and then the point and then some questions, and then the point. I thought we'll never get through this. So we're going to go through the eight points. And if you have a comment as we go through, that's, that'll be fine. If we get to the end, we'll go through the questions and consider some of these things. But we'll move, uh, there's only one slide per point. So uh, you'll note that if you want to comment on order, it's about to not be order. It's about to be the next thing when I hit the next slide. First of all, order, some, some comments. If a defining characteristic of the modern world is disorder, which is just what we're talking about, then the most fundamental act of resistance is to establish order. Isn't that a funny thing? It used to be rebellious to destroy uh, order. And now... The rebellion is trying to establish order, quick, <laughs> quick, fast, in a hurry before there's nothing left. Uh, so it is a, a fundamental act of resistance to establish, to appreciate, and to submit to order. In the classical Christian view, the law itself, Old Testament law, depends on a deeper conception of order, an idea of the way ultimate reality is constructed. The point of life for individual persons, for the church, for the state, is to pursue harmony with that transcendent, eternal order. It's very simple. The Lord says of Himself, I am that I am. A foundational princ a principle of existence, a foundational principle of reality, and not just a principle, but a person, I will say. Um, when He speaks to Moses, and gives Moses something to communicate to the rest of the people, he gives him, first of all, a law. And what is the law? Don't do this, don't do that. Actually, it expresses the character of God himself. And when that law, Ten Commandments, etc., comes down to the people of God, 
they now know what God is like and therefore how they should behave. In other words, a higher order to which this world is to comply. Okay? And you'll notice that uh, it almost seems archaic to see uh, that the, uh, the Ten Commandments posted in, uh, in the area of a, a courthouse. But that's really where it belongs. But where the, when the culture says, I don't know if we believe those things anymore, the judge has to get up with his gavel and say, uh, precedent, I guess? Hear, hear, or whatever he says when he hits the thing. What we did before, we'll do that again. There used to be an overarching belief in reality and the establishment of a higher order that we were following. And so what he's saying here is if you're resisting the idea of anybody telling me what to do at all, um, well, you're going to have trouble with this <laughs> because this is about order. I'm about to switch to the next one. Any, anything else? Anyone want to uh, comment on that? He's establishing, uh, St. Benedict is establishing for his uh, monks a rule of life. And that includes, uh, and is foundational, uh, or is foundationally based upon the idea of order, and not just order for order's sake, but a higher order, compliance with it. Here we have a lot of order in our liturgy, you'll note. That'll be one of the questions if we get to it at the end. Prayer. Uh, a second rule. When we sing, or we sing when we pray, we stand, we sit, we bow, we kneel, we prostrate, said Father Cassian from the monastery in Nursia. The body is very much involved in prayer. It's not just some kind of intellectual meditation. When one advances in prayer, says Father Basil, Basil, one comes to understand that prayer is not so much about asking God for things as simply about being in His presence. We start to see actually in this rule already by the second rule, or the second point, the two are intertwined with each other. The order has been applied to prayer. So that when you come in ten minutes before service, the candles are, all, are already lit. They're not sometimes lit, hopefully, they're always lit. And when I come to the front, I don't turn to you and say, all right, everybody, thanks for coming here this morning. I suppose we'll pray. I say, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. And I don't say, God, we just come to you today and are thankful for our lives. And that's fine. That's, that's another kind of prayer. But this prayer follows an order. Um, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts. You don't wonder what I'm going to say every week because there's order. And the prayer actually involves kneeling, standing, uh, getting out from your pew, walking forward, going back uh, to your pew, sitting down, um, singing. Talk here, don't talk here. Sing here, don't sing here. Stand up, sit down. Uh, it's a perfect for the ADD culture, <laughs> but it also involves the body in prayer. It's a part of, part of the order. What else is involved in this rule of St. Benedict is work, okay? And people say, I'm retired, I don't do work. Well, sorry, here we go. <laughs> Anytime we take something neutral, something material, and we make something out of it for the sake of giving glory to God, it becomes sacramental, not a sacrament. It becomes sacramental. In other words, there's an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. It becomes a channel of grace. We see raking here and we think, oh, you don't mean raking. Yes, <laughs> I do mean raking. Oh, you don't mean wiping the, wind, the mirrors down. You mean, uh, you know, vesting and processing. No, I mean also wiping the mirrors down and mopping the hallway and uh, also putting the cookies out after the thing, because somebody has to put the cookies out, dang it, and uh, uh, that work, something neutral, you, something material, you make something out of it for the sake of giving glory to God, it becomes sacramental. And so, work serves as an expression of charity. Doing it is good for me, it is constitutive of my happiness, because in it and through it, I show love for others. And I'm, 
not going to beat on cookies, but if, you, if no one will do the cookies, they just won't do it, and everyone crosses their arms and says, I will not do it, someone else must do it, we're going to hire somebody. <sighs> There's a, I don't know about that. Uh, you come into the coffee uh, hour and find that there's no coffee, there's no cookies, and why? Because nobody's willing to do it. That ain't right. (laughs) Uh, You find that there's a need in the church and no one's willing to fill that need, even though you know you could. I won't do it. Uh, Why? Because I don't do that anymore. I'm retired or something to that effect. Uh, That's not a good sign. That's not a great sign for a healthy church. And if I was your abbot... I would say, no, you will be putting those cookies out because we need it. I don't care if you're not gifted in cookie putting out. <laughs> this, is, this is your job now. And uh, there is a reason that father is called father because this is the family. And if I do see something like that, I might actually come to you and say, you're the cookie person now. Sorry. Uh, and w- we have cookie people, so we're okay. <laughs> but it may come to that one day. Uh, what's another element of this? Asceticism. He makes a big deal out of this, and we, we should also. The word asceticism comes from ascesis, which simply means training. Okay? Asceticism is an antidote. So listen closely. Asceticism is an antidote to the poison of self-centeredness common in our culture, which teaches us that satisfy, satisfying our own desires is the key to the good life. That message, I will say that good news or that gospel is being preached everywhere. It's being preached on the poster that they stick on the window at McDonald's, two for one. That's the, that's the gospel right there. Who two burgers for the price of one. I'll go in there because that will increase uh, pleasure for minimum amount of expense, and my desires are really at the center of the universe. And so this is, uh, this is, you know, this, this is good, and... Uh, one burger for the price of two is bad because it doesn't meet my desires. Now, that may be true that in some sense it's really bad, but, but uh, when you come to a season like Lent or Advent, an ascetical uh, a, a season of personal discipline, and you say, I don't have to do that. Um, the church doesn't require that of us, and I never do. Besides, I don't like feeling hungry and, uh, or whatever it is that you'd like to give up. It inconveniences my, my uh, innate desire, my right to be pleased at all times and to use all, that I, uh, all the means I can possibly gather to, to, you, to be pleased at all times. Uh, relearning asceticism, that is, how to suffer for the faith, is critical training for Christians living in the world today and the world of the near future. Uh-oh, we're going back to dour here. But what he's saying is, and he says later more, more clearly, is that um, there may come a day when you will be, because of what you believe in the group that you're a part of, you will be denied participation in some element of the culture, some element of the larger culture. And we don't allow your kind in here. If you've never been denied anything in your life, you've never worked on that yourself, you may crumble and fall, or you may say, well, then I don't know about this Christian faith thing because I want to go to the hockey game. And they only let people in that have a little pass that says, I believe this, I, I, I'm just making this up. But you could see it going there, couldn't you, <laughs> in the near future. Uh, if you don't agree with this statement, we can't really, uh, we can't really allow you, you, permit you to, to speak on this street corner because this is the only type of speech we allow. If you've never had any kind of asceticism yourself, this will be a very shocking thing. And he's saying, uh, this is basically your, your workout, <laughs> preparing for what might be uh, in our near future as Christians. That's not the only reason. Asceticism was part of, the, of St. Benedict's plan for in the, in the 5th century. And it was part of what Jesus says in the New Testament about denying yourself. You hear more about that in the sermon today. Stability is the fifth point that he makes here and points out uh, a term that probably will never be used in popular culture, gyro-vague. You'll find some of these church fathers, they come up with words. Someone who's always on the move with no stability. They indulge their own wills. And uh, St. Benedict says this monk is even worse than the hedonistic monk whose only law is desire. 
because he's constantly moving from monastery to monastery, never willing to really acquiesce to any particular uh, abbot, to any particular authority. He's just got his thumb out. Uh, this is the image of his life, always moving on somewhere else, somewhere else. Um, he says, in terms of stability, stability anchors you and gives you the freedom that comes from not being subject to the wind, the waves, and the currents of daily life. It creates the ordered conditions in which the soul's internal pilgrimage towards holiness becomes possible. Now, he gives the, the, the image of the difference between he and his sister, uh, Rod Dreher does, his sister, Grew up in a town, stayed in the same town, uh, and when she got cancer, she had people that had known her her whole life that were able to surround her, and he saw something in that that he was lacking for having followed his desires all over the country, um, and decided to move back to, to his hometown to have something of what his sister had. Now that may not actually apply to your life, may not actually be applicable, to your life, but there is something about that vagabond spirit that's every five years trying something totally and completely different, unrooted from the previous thing, that winds up leaving you uh, unstable. What he's saying is, um, and this is probably self-serving, but if you found a church like St. George's, stick with it. Even if you get upset one day, even if someone says something to you that didn't sit quite right, Resolve it. Uh, work on that resolution. Um, you learn how to extend grace to someone who, you know, it's hard to get along with or something like that. The easiest thing is to just, you know, what do they call it? Cut, what do they call it? Cut bait and just go on to the next, go on to the next. Um, that's not ultimately and in the end very, a very good thing. And that kind of instability really does not lend itself to survival in what he says will be the near future. So you found a good church, right? Stick to it. <laughs> Just stay here. Even if someone says something to you, well, then you've got to work it out. Come talk to Father Paul. We'll get it worked out. Um, and in the end, the, the community, the church will be stronger for it. Speaking of community, point six, we're almost there. Uh, in chapter 3, he talks about community, which is a buzzword, I know. I'm, it, it's becoming not my favorite word, but anyhow, community. To live in a real community, he says, is to put the good of others ahead of our own desires when doing so serves truth and righteousness. Now, that's a, a caveat, okay? In a community like ours, let's call ourselves a community, putting the good of others ahead of your own might mean putting some work into planning something that someone else could have planned, yes, but nobody was, so it's you, okay? You plan it. You make it happen. Um, as long as uh, the service of others is not involved in enabling them in some kind of a, you know, sinful behavior or something like that. Okay, yeah, we're not interested in uh, enabling people in some sort of... I mean, if, if we're going to have a, a kegger at the church, it may take a lot to, to plan a big keg beer fest at the church, but in the end, it actually didn't help anybody. It actually harmed some people. Okay, knock it off. But, that, that, but a golf event, well, that might be good. You know, it's good for the guys. Anyway, we had fun yesterday. Um, it takes work to actually put that together. It takes work to put together the lector list. Somebody has to do it, you know, um, to match the lectors with the schedule. Uh, that community, uh, you may not be the one who wants to do that, but nobody's doing it, so you do it. Um, that's uh, putting others ahead of yourself as long as it serves truth and righteousness. He says, when the light in most... Oh, this is kind of snotty, but... When the light in most people's faces comes from the glow of the laptop, the smartphone, or the television screen, we are living in a dark age. Without real contact with other persons, there is no love. We've never seen a dark age like this one. It's a little snotty, but pretty true. Um... When we're talking about community, we're really talking about interacting with other people, period. Um, and if you can interact with other people in a godly way, that's exactly what he's talking about. Um, and there's something wonderful, I suppose, about uh, being online and being online with other people, but you've got to admit, there's something better about a cup of coffee sitting across a table from someone. 
facial expressions uh, communicate so far more than the words that you type, um, and so much nastiness is there in those chat, <laughs> is it still called the chat room? <laughs> I don't know what it's called. The thing where you type and you say something nasty because it seems anonymous and no one can actually get back at you, so you say something more nasty than you would say, and they get more offended than they would get offended, so they're not nastier to you, and, and it's a downward spiral. If that's the light that comes from you, maybe turn out that light um, and go to church. <laughs> Sit down for coffee hour. Call some people during the week. Find out how they're doing. See if they don't want to meet for lunch. Those are good things. That's part of community. Number seven is hospitality. These are all things in the, the order of St. Benedict. Um, who uh, St. Benedict says, we must never turn away someone who needs our love. The rule commands that all those, present them, all those who present themselves as pilgrims be received like Christ because He will say, I was a stranger and you took me in. I don't know if you've ever been on a, on a retreat at one of the Cistercian monasteries sort of nearby, one in Monk's Corner, Charleston area, and one in Atlanta. And I will say there is something about the way you're received there even on the phone when you call and you make your reservation, they treat you like you were Christ coming to visit them. And I don't know if that's part of the rule, or maybe you've had a different experience, but every time I go and visit one of those monasteries for a retreat, I feel like they're welcoming me, and they would do anything to make sure that this was a fruitful spiritual time for me, even though they don't know me from Adam. They're treating me like it was Christ coming to visit. That's amazing. Um, I have one or two very good experiences at these monasteries where a monk really went out of his way to make sure I was okay, not knowing me from anybody. And I thought, you don't get that everywhere. <laughs> That's part of their rule. He says, I think too many Christians have decided that the world is bad and should be avoided as much as possible. Well, it's hard to convert people if that's your stance. That's a little snotty too. But still... If the world is bad and you don't want to talk to anybody, you don't want to welcome anybody and don't want to uh, interact with, with the world at all, it's pretty hard to convert people. But if you treat everyone who comes to you as Christ was coming to you, uh, it's pretty hard to turn them away. Finally, balance, before we get to our discussion. If a community relaxes its discipline too much, it will dissolve. But if it's too rigid, it will make people crazy. If you want... And if you want it, well, let's just stick with that for a second for the next part. Uh, St. Benedict is not original in his, his desire to make a pretty reasonable rule. You'll, you'll recall that he says the rule was not devised for the spiritual superhero. It was devised for the lazy one, actually. To, and it was devised in kind of a middle-of-the-road middle kind of way. Uh, St. Benedict didn't get that from himself. I have a little bit of study in the, in the fathers that he built his, his rule upon. And they said, this is Evagrius and Cassian, they said, uh, don't fast too much. Don't deny yourself too much. Number one, you'll get discouraged, you'll give up. Number two, you'll get proud of yourself and defeat the whole purpose altogether. A reasonable rule, something balanced in the middle, something like two penitential seasons a year. Not 12 penitential seasons a year, two, Advent and Lent. And when Advent and Lent come along, use those seasons. Don't let it, you know, don't let it pass you by. Um, but you don't have to clobber yourself all year long because you'll get uh, discouraged or you'll start to look at others and say, look at these lazy people. Uh, compared to me, really, uh, they're not so hot. And that actually defeats the whole purpose. You might as well not fast at all if that attitude is the attitude you wind up with in the end. Uh, if you, I don't know, like this next part, but anyway. If you want to judge a community, he says, uh, you need to see what their fruit is. And I think that's probably good. Are they growing? I don't always count that as a, as a sign of health, not necessarily. Are they growing? But that's not too bad. Um, are they cheerful? That's pretty good. Are they happy? Ooh, I don't know. Cheerful. Let's go back to cheerful. 
And uh, are they doing good and helping people? That's pretty good. Are they cheerful? Are they doing good and helping people? Or is your community one, your church one, in which as soon as that service is over, and even before the service is over, people are leaving because they just came for the one thing and they're leaving now? Or, do the, or is your church one in which people don't want to leave? I can't get a vestry meeting started because they're still talking so much in the parish hall. And we have to say, be quiet. Um, but anyhow, those are some good signs of a, potentially of a balanced church. We don't relax our discipline too much. Um, and it, yeah, but if we make it too rigid, it makes people crazy. I would say crazy isn't the right word. Um, nevertheless, p- p- perhaps, well, they're uh, pharisaical, proud, um, arrogant, exclusive. There's a bunch of words that go along with being too rigid. Um, but now we got a little bit of time for questions. Before we do that, I'm, I just have a, a way of asking a couple of questions point by point through these. But I wonder if there's any that are, that are burning on your minds right now or, or things you'd like to discuss about those eight things that Rod Dreher points out for the rule for life. Yes, Joe. Uh, Paul, wouldn't you say that the order aspect of all of those eight different areas kind of drives all the other seven? Uh, you mean order drives the others? Yeah. yeah. I think that's right. And you notice that when a man is ordained, he is ordained into holy orders. It's an order. And you look, you look through the Book of Common Prayer and you look at the name of the liturgy, oftentimes the name is the order for... Uh, anyway, what I'm saying is uh, you've got every once in a while the liturgy is, is called the order. But that order is in place so that charity is preserved because it's right there in the order so that uh, hospitality is preserved it's right there in the order so that uh, even even uh, principles like forgiveness are in the order it's part of our order okay you're not monastics but you are part of an order uh, when I get up, as I said before, and say, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, that means everything about you is not a secret. It's all wide open to Him. You can hide it from the person next to you. And then that's what says, oh my goodness, I'm in the middle of an ocean and there's no bottom to it. Can I please have some sort of order? And the next order is cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love thee. Oh my goodness, tell me more about that because that sounds a lot like structure. That sounds like order. That sounds like something good. And the rest of it, you're right, is sort of hung upon that order. Although uh, I would say the chief, the chief principle is love. How do you express love if there's no order? That's right. Like he says, uh, um, what was it? community. He said it has to be in accordance with truth and righteousness. You may want to love and have a loving relationship with a person if you're a doctor who has a diagnosis that's bad. And so since the diagnosis is bad and you don't want to mess up that warm relationship you have, you think the best thing is not to tell them what their diagnosis is. Don't tell them what it is because it'll be uncomfortable. They won't like it. They won't be happy. So we won't tell them. That is the wrong application of order, and that are the wrong application of love. The correct order would be to diagnose properly and to attend to the difficulty. And we're speaking vaguely about morals here. Um, It's not a loving thing to tell someone there's nothing wrong when there is something wrong. So the order is right there with the love, isn't it? Anything else? Ah, yes, Rusty. Yeah, there's a passage in here. Uh, somebody's uh, a monk's teaching somebody how to pray. Right. And at the end of the session, I guess he was making progress. He says, why, why are you doing it this way? And his response was, I needed to get you out of your head. Right. And so if you learn things in a certain order or a cycle of prayer or something like that, you don't even have to think about it because it's ingrained in you. You've got an order. It's right. It's like getting up and getting ready to go to school or whatever else. If you have to think about every step or have to look at a list, you're not, you're not really doing it. 
It's true. Yeah, that. Yeah, that specific instance is, is Rod Dreher himself, who was having some sort of emotional problem, and his priest told him to, to use the Jesus prayer, pray it for an hour. And he said it was the hardest thing at first, but then it got into him, and it actually helped quite a bit. And there's some folks uh, in our parish that use the Jesus prayer, basically wake up with it. It's, it's like on repeat. <laughs> Uh, Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And when they hit their thumb with the hammer, it's Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And when they're making the, sk the, the spaghetti, it's Lord Jesus, have, the Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And when they're going to church on the way there, they're saying the same thing. That was ingrained in them on either the Orthodox Church or part of their own tradition. Those are good things. Um, as long as they're not empty repetition, and I don't, I don't think they are, um, yeah, it's basically an order. It's a strategy. Um, anything else? Yeah, Bob. I'm about to make a comment about the stability of the realm. Yes. Stability is a very good thing in terms of a church. Now, you're speaking to a person and you're within a church that left the church. We left the Episcopal Church in 1970, in 1970 whatever, uh, 60 whatever for others. Um, and so there needs to be some reasonable... Uh, um, there seems to be some reasonable consideration there. Sometimes it is the right time to leave, but every once in a while, the only reason you want to leave is because it's difficult for you to forgive a person. <laughs> and that's the reason you're going to leave. Actually, it'd be better for you to forgive the person and learn how to move on. Uh, the only reason you don't, uh, the only reason you want to leave is you're tired of that particular type of music or something like that. You ever been to a monastery where the monks can't sing? It's, it is pathetic. It's awful. But they do it morning, noon, and night over and over and over and over again. And you know it's grating on some of them that the singing is not good. They call it the choir. The choir is not good. And Thomas Merton, I listen to him a lot, and he says much of the tension in the monastery comes from the choir. The, the choir is not doing well. I don't mean, the, it's a different use of the word choir. I'm not talking about our choir. But I'm just saying, uh, for some that would say, if I was somewhere else where the choir was better, I would be able to pray. And so they uproot everything and go find another place where they're singing a different tune. And they sit down there and five years later they realize they're in the same spot they were before, except for that it's all new people. Uh, you got to just tough it out. <laughs> That's life. Uh, Mike. Yeah. And that corollary is for the church to be pure. That happens. That's, that's right. A lot of folks will say, I didn't, well, I'm not beating up in the Episcopal Church because it's part of our history. Most of us would say, uh, who came from the Episcopal Church, I didn't leave the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church left me. Why is our whole group called the Continuing Anglican Church? Because we're continuing in the way that Anglicanism had been going for centuries. And if the church uh, t veers off to the left and you say, at that fork in the road, you say, wait a second, um, I don't know what I'm doing anymore because this doesn't seem right. Yeah, you can't, it's possible to be lost, but what I'm saying is if, if a Christian is simply fussy and they've gone from church to church because they're fussy, that's not great. Um, and in a, in a sense, it's not a great thing that we have a church in every corner in Greenville because that means you're the consumer. You're a shopper. And any time you're not quite uh, uh, happy with the coffee of this brand, you just drop it. Drop that church and go to the one next door. Um, I think as pastors we need to get better about receiving people that are, have left their church for no reason. Call the previous pastor and say, hey, I've got so-and-so at my church. Is that okay? And the guy says, no. And you say, well, I'm going to send him back then because, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Uh, 
most of the time when people switch, it's, it's, a, it's a good reason. But every once in a while, it's just, uh, you know, couldn't get along or something like that. Um, but every once in a while, there is a real problem. Uh, so we, we're out of time. The questions that I was going to ask or, or discuss are basically what we're discussing right now. Um, see, I knew I needed to leave it to the end. But um, any, other, any other points of discussion? We talked about order being really at the heart of this and the fact that our liturgy is the way it is and our holy orders are the way they are is not a random thing and it's actually for your benefit and even in the end if you don't understand a particular order the point is and this is one of the things that he brings up uh, is it okay to submit to an order even if you don't understand the rule yet he says yes and that uh, re requires trust and that requires uh, belief that your spiritual father has your good in mind and though he's asked you to do something you don't quite understand yet, you're willing to do it because uh, you're not the abbot, actually, and the abbot has the, the good of the monk in mind. And so when he says, we don't offer chocolate bars at the, in the mess hall anymore, and you say, I really don't like that, and I don't know if I can abide that, I don't understand why, and you think of all the reasons why you should have it, and you want to have a fight, and you want to talk, it's probably better to just acquiesce to that, and then maybe the spiritual father will say the chocolate bars come back uh, after Lent is over or something. But um, that idea of acquiescing to a, to a rule that you don't understand, if you understand completely our liturgy and our mess, congratulations. That's pretty good. There's a lot of stuff in there that most people don't understand, including some clergy, don't understand exactly why. Um, but one thing I've always experienced in coming to the Anglican Church, I had a million questions, and I was told it takes 10 years to become an Anglican, and that means you'll never think of all the questions you, you have in one sitting. It, one will engender another, and that one will engender another, and that one will engender another question, but does that mean you can't acquiesce? No, you can acquiesce. My experience has been there's always a really good answer to the question I have that I think is going to be so difficult. Um, and what the Benedict Option is saying in some of these things about order and stability and all that is just be patient. It'll come. The, the answers to the questions will come. Um, that's all we're going to talk about today, unless there's another. We're out of time, really. But Magda? What's the whole purpose? Very good. And now we're out of time. Thank you. Okay. Nursia or Church of Second Frame. Okay. The, with the, the high ceilings, yeah, I know. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, I, those, those images, I just pull them off the internet. Yeah, I just type in church. And I'll scroll through all the images, and I get the one that's the one that's communicating what I like. So I don't know exactly. Oh, turn this off.